Anyways, thank you, Jason. And um, I, it's up to you. Have fun. Great. Thank you so much. It's great to see you all again. Um, yeah, so our, we had our first presentation that focused on, it was titled Monster Seaweed, and it talked about uh, harnessing nature solutions and repurposing them. Last uh, presentation I gave was on the global plastic pollution crisis. And so what we're gonna talk about today is um, sustainable aquaculture. So this is titled um, Keep the Ocean Wild, Fish from Farm to Table. I'm gonna move this bar. So we are at a fundamental, fundamentally a critical time in our future of life here on earth. We haven't really talked a lot as a society about the ocean. And it is really uh, an honor for me to come and speak to all of you and, and to find out that there's even interest in, um, in all of these different marine conservation topics because we have to protect our ocean. It is a critical life support system for all of us. And currently it is in danger. So what the ocean gives us? Well, first it gives us provision. It gives us food, it gives us oxygen, it gives us water. Every other breath of life we take is derived from the ocean. Uh, it is also critical food supply for over 3 billion people worldwide. So very tangibly, it, it directly feeds us. Um, it gives us regulation of our climate and temperature. So. The ocean is the world's largest carbon sink. So as we burn fossil fuels and we put CO2 emissions into the atmosphere, we have different ways of sequestering that. Jason, are you switching slides, by the way? Or are you uh, still yeah. on the main screen? Oh, yes, I did switch slides. We still see you on the main screen. Um, okay, I'm going to. How about now? Okay, yep, yeah, you switched it. Okay, great. We're still good. We can still see it. Okay. So this is what I was referring to. So provision, food, oxygen, and water, regulation of our climate and temperature. So all of the excess heat that it needs to be absorbed to keep our ecosystem in flux, the ocean absorbs 90% of that excess heat. And when I say it's the largest carbon sink, what that means is as we burn fossil fuels and put CO2 emissions into the atmosphere, in order to keep a balanced ecosystem, we also have to sequester that. And so trees do that. Uh, we talked about seagrasses and sargassum and mangroves do that. But the ocean is the world's largest carbon sink. It is actually sequestering carbon, which would otherwise throw the regulation of our climate and temperature completely out of whack. And so as you see increasing storms and the increased severity of those storms, that is because we are throwing this regulation out of whack. Uh, it is a critical support. So it actually filters pollution, processes waste, uh, and then it's culturally important, right? I mean, this is something that is, gives us healing and fun and recreation and inspiration. It's something we enjoy. So some solutions to human impact on the ocean. So we, um, we have sort of emerged <laughs> in this crisis. We also need to emerge from community requests, from NGOs who have public support, and then who are funded by the government industry and private philanthropy. And so to talk about that, what that means is early investments in whales, marine mammals, some marine parks, um, th really these are laws that we've had in the 1970s and we haven't really built upon them since, right? And so that was 50 years ago. And so a lot of our investments or our laws are antiquated and need to be updated. There's a, a emerging focus on the depletion of ocean resources beginning in the 1980s and early 1990s, where we started saying, wow, 
the ocean has a lot of really good stuff for us as private industry. And so we started depleting the ocean of vital minerals, of vital uh, resources of overfishing. So what do we need to do? Well, one of the first things that we can do as the United States is end domestic overfishing and destructive practices like uh, bottom trawling, which is uh, ripping up and just capturing everything instead of taking a targeted approach. Uh, end excess take and indiscriminate gear um, and then improve, uh, improve our governance. So the Magnum Stevens Act. Um, Tammy, I, I think there's a, a beeping on maybe your end. I don't know if you can mute or maybe that's someone else's computer, but um, just flagging that. And then um, the ocean is inherently international. So you get 200 nautical miles off your shore. Outside of that is what's called the high seas. Half of the ocean are high seas. The ocean is two thirds of the Earth's surface, right? So if you think about how much of the world are high seas, a lot of this is just governed by international treaties, uh, international maritime law. And so this is where the, U the UN and all of the different participating countries play a critical role in creating, here's the rules of the road so that we don't massively deplete the resources of this global supply. Uh, one of the things that private ocean philanthropy investments have uh, had success doing is focusing on adding US sanctuaries and improving sanctuary plants to protect sea life. And this is where we're gonna um, go into aquaculture and what that is. So targeted creation of domestic MPAs, those are marine protected areas. Uh, this is um, giving the example of California Marine Protection Act are critical in saying, okay, we are gonna designate this area for protection and monitoring and it's not gonna be you know, depleted from commercial fishing or ruined because of excess recreational activity. And so it's a way of just carving out critical ecosystems. Okay, one of the things that is a, um, we've all talked about, and this feeds on our, my presentation from last time is, so 1980s, 1990s, we're talking about 40, 50 years ago, there starts to be this massive trend of depletion. About 10 years ago, we started to really recognize that and people started investing. And a lot of different things have been drawn to our attention in financial investment over the last 10 years. So obviously plastic and marine debris, seismic and acoustic pollution. So this is where if you know there's deep sea mining or something that's going on, that mining isn't just affecting the area that is, you know, that they're actually doing the mining in, but it's sending out these shock waves and that seismic activity is affecting marine life. Um, and then the effects, of course, of climate change and ocean acidification, which is the changing chemistry of the ocean that makes it more acidic. Okay, so dynamics impacting the world's ocean. So PPM, parts per million. So there is an organization, uh, if, if you guys have ever heard of the gentleman named Bill McKibben, he started an organization years ago called 350.org. And the reason he called it 350.org is because all of the science said, if the CO2 levels reach beyond 350 parts per million in the atmosphere, we reach the point of those effects being irreversible. Meaning even if we stopped burning fossil fuels, if we don't reduce, that's the threshold. Once you get past the threshold, you start to be, you see the effects of climate change. This is showing you where we are. We are at 400 parts per million. This was in 2012 and it's, it's just a little bit about over this now. So 350 is our threshold. We are at 400 right now. 
the reason you're like, okay, well, I wanted to know about aquaculture. I wanted to know about fishing. I get that fossil fuels are bad. Why are you telling me about this? The reason I'm telling you about this is because this is what is driving sustainable aquaculture because the habitat in which our fish are supposed to just naturally grow is becoming more toxic, is becoming almost inhabitable. And therefore it is affecting the way that we can fish. So if, if you take nothing else away from this presentation, take this slide away, we are at 400 parts per million and the threshold is 350. And that's why when scientists say we have to radically curb fossil fuels and carbon emissions, they're not guessing, they're scientifically evaluating, we are beyond the threshold. So, I just mentioned that fish populations are in trouble. Um, we are, uh, first of all, just overfishing. We're taking far too many out to maintain the population. So there just needs to be a steady, we can fish, we just can't overfish. Uh, many of the ones we're taking out represent either the biggest, which are therefore the most fertile and reproduce, or they're the smallest, which means they're critical to the food chain. Right, so we're taking the smallest out because they, maybe they're a delicacy, or we're taking the biggest out because you can get the most per pound. That is not sustainable. Uh, high seas fisheries, so again, high seas are those ungoverned waters, 200 plus nautical miles offshore. They would be honestly uneconomical without national subsidies for these long distancing fleets. So these vessels that go out for weeks at a time, that's not economically viable, actually. It's very expensive to pay the crew, to the cost of the vessel, the fuel, the operations. And so what happens is our government subsidizes these bad behaviors. And then the thing that nobody really wants to talk about, but actually needs to be a part of it, is slave labor. So we like to think of slavery as being extinct. It is not when it comes to fishing. This is a real thing that is happening. Slave labor is being used. There's an amazing documentary called Ghost Fleet, which tracks this uh, throughout Indonesia and Southeast Asia. And they literally have people on ships for 12, 15 years at a time. They never dock on shore. What happens is a different ship comes, takes what they have caught, and then they go through customs and port and inspection, and they never see the slaves that stayed out there for literally 15 years. I mean, this is, it sounds crazy. I'm not being hyperbolic. This is a real thing that is happening. And if you're eating tuna, it's highly likely that it was handled by this type of labor. Uh, and then the fisheries right now are supplying luxury products, right? Escargot is a perfect example of that. They, this does not actually contribute to global food security, it's, it's fulfilling a very niche market. Uh, and then the ways in which we capture, process, and transport fish are fundamentally destruction to the ocean floor and the tide line. I mentioned trudging along. And, it, and so we are throwing the balance uh, out of whack as a result. So what are we gonna do about it, okay? I just gave you a very like doom and gloom scenario, but you know, that is the truth. That's just the honest truth. This is an example of, of aquaculture in the water. These are some of the, um, this is what it looks like. So aquaculture has actually supported worldwide food security for millennia. Indigenous communities have had their own form practicing of aquaculture for many, many years. Um, now we're figuring out how do we do it sustainably and to ward off all of these other uh, challenges that I mentioned. Uh, aquaculture right now already provides more fish protein than wild caught. So that's really the difference we're talking about. Aquaculture, these targeted types of, of um, fishing mechanisms versus wild caught. Uh, deliberate production of marine creatures and plants for food, for the medical, for energy, it's just expanding so rapidly. And so that's also something we just have to recognize as the population grows, as our life expectancy gets older, like our population is growing, there's just, we just need more stuff. So if we don't do it sustainably, things that used to be sustainable 
a hundred years ago or 50 years ago may not be sustainable now just because we have more people. So that leads to this. Aquaculture is a viable solution, but it is not growing fast enough to keep up with the population growth. So current aquaculture rate is 6%. We need that to be 10% to meet the current population growth trends. Okay, here's how aquaculture can meet the need. So overall, all type of marine uh, food protein, uh, food security for over 3 billion people, but fish alone are essential for over 1 billion people, which is 50% uh, of the animal protein for 400 million people in the poorest countries, right? So you're, you have to think about people that are living in island communities, living in places in Asia, Southeast Asia. I mean, these are living in indigenous communities. I mean, coastal communities, um, that, that's who we're, who we're talking about when we talk about a critical food security. Um, our supply of fish for human consumption <laughs> has outpaced population growth. So, you know, we've really doubled the level. Uh, and, you know, in 2014, aquaculture production reached 73.8 million tons. So just to give you an idea of like how much protein we are actually producing from these aquaculture production practices. Okay, this is probably gonna blow your mind a little bit. Global aquaculture production by region. China, Asia, 90%. 90% of global aquaculture production is done by China and Asia. North America, not even just the United States, but Canada, Mexico, I mean, all of North America is only 1.5% of global aquaculture production. So this is a new thing uh, for us here in North America. We are not leading the way, Asia and China are leading the way. And this is very much something that we need to um, you know, catch up on. So what I just said, China leads the way. Norway and Vietnam are number two and three. So it's not just uh, Asian countries, but your Nordic countries, they're also uh, on the front lines of this as well. And you have, you know, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Iceland, all doing this well. In Nigeria, aquaculture output is up almost by 20 times over in just the last 20 years. Uh, and, you know, sub-Saharan Africa is not far behind. So if you're getting the hint here, the United States is lagging. Uh, aquaculture attributes to 11 million jobs, mostly again in these developing countries, and 50% are women. So this isn't just a food security thing. This isn't just a, a, a sustainability thing. This is a real economic thing where these can provide good jobs and there's some equity distributed amongst those jobs. Um, we do need to draw a distinction between when we talk about food security and consumer choice. Okay, that's very important. Food security is the basic protein we need to deliver to the poorest regions, emerging economies, emerging countries. But then there is consumer choice where you go to the grocery store and you say, I want salmon today versus trout versus shrimp. And why this is important to recognize why someone who cares deeply and who works for a foundation that cares deeply about sustainability, why we also care about consumer choice is because consumer choice drives demand. And we also know that when you're eating fish, people are giving you health tips, right? They're saying, well, you know, maybe there's lower levels of mercury in this fish. Maybe this fish has better protein or, you know, higher rates of omega-3 fatty acids. And so we understand that it's not all gonna be equal. Consumers are gonna drive demand based on their choice. And so we think that it's important to just distinguish um, between the two and that we base it on value, not just per pound. 
Um, the good news for food security and environmental sustainability, about half of global production of animals, shellfish, carp, uh, and plants, including seaweed and microalgae, they came from non-fed species. So aquaculture, when we say, but can it really fill the demand? It's already filling about half of it right now. Okay, so this is a fun little chart here. So farming, aquaculture versus wild catch. You can see in 1970, uh, this didn't really exist. This is in millions of tons uh, produced. It didn't really exist. And then about here in 2000, well, maybe I guess in, in about you know, 1995 to 2000 is when it really exponentially took off and wild catch has leveled off. Now that's a good thing. We actually need wild catch to go down a little bit and, and aquaculture to, to increase. But um, we just wanted to kind of show where that has occurred over the years. Uh, now we've all heard a lot about trade deficits, <laughs> right? Whatever, whatever, all political persuasions aside, I mean, the US talks about trade deficits and I mentioned a lot about China and uh, countries in Asia being this leading in production. And so aquaculture is a key way that we can actually shift the balance on a perceived trade deficit. Um, <clears throat> because right now we are importing a lot of uh, what we're getting from those countries when we could be exporting things like Maine lobster or Alaskan pollock, right? So there's real economic value to shift the scale of this trade deficit by exporting some of our delicacies. Um, and then, you know, we, we just need, um, we need this to grow because populations are growing and we cannot meet that need with the consumption of beef alone. On that, let's talk about resource efficiency. So I apologize that these numbers are a little blurry, but I think you, you get the point. So this is beef, this is pork, this is fish. So conversion efficiency. So this is, you know, talking about how much energy it takes. And then these are the admissions that are released. Again, beef, pork, chicken, fish, um, and, and, and biovalves like, you know, clams. Beef compared to fish, I mean, it just, we, we, it requires so much more energy. We burn so much more carbon doing it. And so um, fish from a carbon standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, is significantly better than pork or beef. So world farmed fish and beef production. So this, this top dotted line is beef. And you can see from 1950, this is where it starts, all the way up here to 2010, pretty steady climb. Farmed fish into almost non-existent until again, about that 1995 mark, and then it's just exponentially. And now it's actually outpacing beef production. So what are the elements of sustainable agriculture? The first is environmental protection. And shout out to Tammy for using this photo, which she took from our website as the backgrounds. Awesome, great job. These are all aquaculture pods. Um, so environmental protection. So it has to be done in a sustainable way. Human welfare, um, social justice. These two, what we really mean is, to, is, is utilizing equity and, and having it create local jobs. Economic viability. So as I pointed out, there's a clear market for this. Uh, physical longevity. So this gets to infrastructure. There needs to be real investment, right? This can't be fly by night operation, there needs to be real infrastructure and that that infrastructure can last the test of time. Public education, literally what we're doing right now. This is very new. Most people don't think about, when they think about the fish at their store, they think of a you know, fisherman, they have a very you know, iconic idea out in the middle of the ocean. I don't know, I think of like the movie, The Perfect Storm, like George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg out there fishing and like they're bringing it back. It's like, that's not necessarily how it's happening right now. And in those cases, maybe they're using slave labor or, or what else. So 
we have to educate people about what's happening. And then like anything else, there are real scientific advancements that are happening. Um, and so, you know, I will go into some of those. So sustainable aquaculture focus. So six impacts for our focus on the future. So fish feed and oil from the wild, um, we can eliminate the destruction of habitat. We can mitigate water pollution because if we're doing it in, con in a controlled area, uh, chemicals and drugs, uh, and then our energy usage. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I think what's really important is that the people who are working on aquaculture are not reinventing the wheel. They are taking what, so terrestrial refers to is your traditional farming, on land farming. And what they're doing is they're thinking, okay, what have we actually learned about how to do this better, right? And so this just kind of gives you an idea of the compare and contrast about, you know, the first one relates to hunting. Uh, the second talks about the transition from hunting to ranching. You know, and so it sort of goes through this history uh, of, of how we are doing this. Okay, so new trends. So RES, recycle aquaculture system, aquaponics, algae biofuels. What does this mean? This means all of the kind of toxic conditions like algal, algal blooms that you all experience in Florida or red tide that you all experience in Florida, you can have a system that's closed loop filtering the water, not affected by any of that, right? So there's improving technologies that are getting at all, getting at all of these toxics. Polyculture aquaculture, what this just means is an integrated approach, multiple species um, that you, you might be farming. Uh, a focus on herbivores. So if you plant uh, what they eat in the system, you can also take the pressure off the use of wild animals, right? So the thing you're farming, you then don't have to get feed for that thing. And then you actually end up producing a healthier product and better fish food. So um, there is an improved ratio of, you know, right now what our fish are eating may not actually be the best. And so if you're literally deciding what they're eating, you can make sure that they're getting the healthiest food, which then we get the most nutrients out of. And this is happening on sustainable on-land farming, right? This is the big talk about grain-fed versus grass-fed beef and that there's different nutrient values to that. That same principle applies to aquaculture. Another new trend is, is addressing the global unemployment problem. So this provides real viable jobs and can help in alleviating some of the global poverty goals in some of these developing countries. Um, there are changes in the market. Some people are demanding organic food, right? You see the organic label. Some people want to know the omega-3 fatty acids. So this is something that will be easier to track. There is international cooperation. So there's 14 European partners created IDREEM, but basically what that is, is it's a European uh, agreement to have a more efficient and sustainable aquaculture industry. So the EU is, is focused on this. And then a rise of community-based constituencies. So, you know, grassroots groups um, can actually participate in this process, whereas in traditional um, markets, it's really dominated by a few monopolies. So ocean philanthropy interest. So we're, we're basically saying, okay, how are people like helping to spur this on? We're, okay, this is a good idea. What are, we, what are we doing about it? So people are coming into supporting aquaculture because they're concerned about habitat destruction, pollution, uh, disease, you know, they're worried about diseases and they're worried about human rights issues. 
people are coming to aquaculture because they're worried about human rights issues and the real slave labor issue. Other industries like Taylor Shellfish or like real top private companies like restaurants are worried about OA, ocean acidification. Ocean acidification affects the shellfish industry and tremendously in the Northwest, like in places like Seattle. And so they're like, okay, we have to figure out how we can mitigate oysters, shellfish, all different types of things from ocean acidification. Okay, aquaculture may be a way to do that. There's concern about rising temperatures yeah, and, and in-water production options, and obviously a growing concern about just the overall carbon and oxygen production that's happening. To continue that, people are also worried about microplastics and toxins. Uh, people are worried about food security and tour the tourism industry. And they're also looking at just the kind of cultural value of, of these markets. And so there's a lot of different ways that people have come into supporting sustainable aquaculture. And that's why when I showed the bar graph, it was, you know, from 1995, 2000, why it's shooting up all of these reasons. So different contexts demand different solutions. I'm not going to go through all of these, but just we need to um, empower communities to be resilient. We have to focus on farming ocean greens and inexpensive fish. Uh, we do have to recognize the commercial interest. So we have to meet the less of the luxury scale, luxury, but also the scale of what's going in the grocery store. And then um, we have to put this in context of, are we keeping our overall ecosystem in check? So um, another reason why you should embrace aquaculture, threats to in-water pollution. So storm sur surges, when you have a storm that comes through and you have flooding and you have sewage runoff, all of these things usually end up in your bays, in your rivers, in your oceans. That's not great for the food you're about to eat. So water quality control is a big reason why uh, aquaculture is, is a good thing. Water temperature and chemistry control. Again, warding off things like red tide, algal blooms, ocean acidification, you can fix those by using a controlled environment. Uh, here's all of the different environmental and social impacts and benefits. We went through those. Okay, we're getting here to the end. Standards. So these are all the different, these logos I have here. These are all the different types of certifications and standards that exist. The Monterey Bay Aquarium in California has, they are known, and we agree, with having the best sustainability scorecard. You want to know where your fish is, like traceability, they are really good at that. There are basically four different things you should worry about when it comes to wild caught fish. First is slave labor. Second is sustainability. So <laughs> this is going to blow your mind. We don't have a lot of the infrastructure that maybe you might think we normally have. Deshelling of shrimp is a good example. So a shrimping operation in, let's say, off Louisiana will go out. They'll catch shrimp off the coast of Louisiana. But then they don't have the infrastructure to necessarily deshell that. So they put it on a boat, they ship it to China, which is using very cheap labor. They deshell that, they ship it back to Louisiana. Then they stamp caught wild in Louisiana. But it went to China in between them catching it and going to your grocery store. So when we talk about sustainability, that's what we're talking about. That is highly unsustainable to burn that much carbon going across the country, let alone that's not fresh. 
So slave labor, sustainability, health. So this is where we get into like mercury, plastic, all different types of pollution that could be in the fish you're eating. Uh, and then the third is traceability. So, and this is, or that could be called fraud. So I don't know if you guys know this, but over 50% of the white fish in your grocery store, except for Whole Foods, because they took this seriously, but any other grocery store, that white fish is not the white fish they're saying it is. It is probably something else because there's no traceability of where it was caught and what it is. And so they will fraudulently label fish that go at a higher price on the market. So aquaculture helps <laughs> eliminate those four things. There's still a place for wild caught, but those are the four things you really need to worry about, that it isn't what it says it is, that it has pollution or toxins in it, that it was handled by slave labor or that it was just done in the most unsustainable way. And so that is why a lot of people are pushing for these standards to be adopted all over and um, for aquaculture to work. And then um, for these standards to work, we do believe like certification incentives need to exist. They don't really exist beyond the farm level. So unless you're farming that instead of just having a targeted system, so that's something we're calling on. Um, public perceptions. So salmon is the number one thing. These are all the rest I mentioned, um, but, but it is important for people to know like this stuff is, is happening. Um, you know, I already mentioned this, we need it. We need aquaculture. We need to be moving production onshore Okay, so there is a place for in the water, but actually we're a proponent of sustainable aquaculture being done onshore if possible, and it's not always possible, but then you're maintaining those marine assets and that ecosystem. We need to recognize that while we're talking about this in a new way, it's been done for millennia. And then commercially successful models do exist, but the way that they're doing it right now, the energy consumption is still not to our liking. So we do need to improve just the efficiency of that. But as a new emerging market in the United States, we, we expect that it will improve. And then we have to rethink <laughs> um, and reorient wealthy consumer preferences for carnivores. And this, you know, this sort of gets into everything, but the kind of delicacy market that exists. Um, and most marine funders are shifting towards aquaculture um, and, and then paying far more attention to this. Uh, I went over these and that's it. So I'm gonna stop sharing uh, my, my slide now, but basically, you know, the bottom line is this is a viable solution that, you know, can work, has worked for millennia, and um, we just need to get better and smarter about how we do it. So I will stop there and answer any questions you have. And again, thank you all for taking so much time on a Thursday night. You could be doing anything and you're learning about sustainable aquaculture. So thank you. Anybody have any questions? Because you know I do, but. Do so I do to... I. Uh, pardon? So do I. Okay, well, you go first, members first. <laughs> um, I was wondering, uh, the, I've always made it a point to buy wild caught salmon, wild caught this, wild caught that, because I thought it was healthier. And now I'm hearing that um, it's better for our planet, our ocean, if we purchase farmed fish. And I remember reading articles in, in some countries, the um, fish are plied, the farmed fish are plied with different antibiotics and they sit in their own waste and that 
they're very unhealthy for you. Yeah, so what do I do? Salmon for 10 yes. So you are correct. Wild hut is healthier. What you've been told is correct. What we are saying is that we need to create this process. And that's where I was sort of pointing at is that the United States is really 1.5% is, is done in sustainable aquaculture. So the reason they're telling you wild caught is healthier and better is because we haven't really embraced this model yet. So we're calling on this to be embraced, but in the meantime, yes, wild caught is going to be healthier. Um, but it is important to look at the traceability. And so if, if you want the most sustainable and the healthiest, use the Monterey Bay scorecard. And I'm gonna send this to Tammy and she'll send it to everyone, but it has every fish and it will tell you exactly, because wild caught isn't the best, everything's different. Some you want wild caught, some you don't. This has like a very easy scorecard you could literally take to the grocery store and it would tell you uh, exactly what to look for. But, but you are correct and I will send that to, to Tammy. Thank you. Ms. Sheila, you have a question? Unmute yourself. Okay. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, okay. You're telling us about the shrimp from Louisiana. And I was wondering, I buy most of my shrimp with the shell on and I deshell it myself. Am I better off? Is it coming straight from Louisiana in that case? Or is yep. it still being processed someplace else? Nope. Or how does that work? Not, not likely. Uh, and, you know, the local operations, you know, to be clear, like if you are in Louisiana and you go to a local place, then it, they probably did just pull it off the boat. I'm more talking about like the massive companies that are supplying the grocery stores. If you're going to like a local market, then I'm sure it's local. But if it has the shell on it, then no, you've probably alleviated that problem. Okay, the other question, one more question. Um, I just, I used to love tilapia and I stopped mm -hmm. eating it because I heard such bad stuff about it. <laughs> but then last week I bought it and it was outstanding. <laughs> yeah. So I, I mean, will, it's, I, uh, it's the, what, you know, what you recommend as far as eating tilapia. Uh, I would just, yeah, in moderation, but, but yeah, I mean, there's so many things changing. And I think what most people are worried about is just the fundamental recognition that we're putting a lot of toxins and pollutants in our ocean. And so it's trying to send a signal that's like, oh, well, we don't really know like how that affects it. So I, I, if you're eating it in moderation, then it, I think it's totally fine. Yeah. And um, again, the scorecard I send you will show you what the current science is saying for each type that's, of fish. That's great. Looking forward to seeing it. Because it is always changing. And so they update it, but they do, but it does change. I don't know if I can unmute. Yes, you're unmuted. Yep, you did it. Am I unmuted, Tammy? Yes. yes. Oh, good. Uh, listen, uh, is there a difference, let's say, in the area from which fish are farmed? I was under the impression that salmon that was farmed in Ireland and Scotland and Norway are preferable to a lot of the things that are farmed in North America. Is that true? Yeah, probably, yeah. I mean, Norway for sure. Ireland and Scotland, I don't know, but Norway for sure. And I think part of it is that we have a big salmon demand in the United States. And uh, it's not about how we collect, like Alaskan salmon, it's probably the best salmon in the world, mm -hmm. right? So it's not about the health. The salmon issue is about the ecosystem. So here's what's happening. And it has nothing to do with um, uh, fishing salmon. So there's something called the San Juan Islands mm -hmm. off, off yeah. Puget Sound. All right. What that is, is that there's a lot of wealthy people who live off these islands driving their yachts and their boats. And then there's also com a commercial vessel lane 
the sound of their boats is disrupting the salmon uh, mating from happening, which is depleting the supply for the orca whales. Oh, so. so the orcas are highly threatened because they're not getting the salmon supply. And there's an evolutionary weird thing happening where they've literally gone in and they've tried to give them different salmon or different, and they just like won't eat it. It's like they only eat this wow. one. But so that's not a case where we're overfishing or the salmon is unhealthy. It's like we disrupt, we disrupted the spawning of the salmon, which then is having the, the rippling effect of disrupting the orca because that is their food supply. It doesn't affect the health for you eating that salmon. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. But that's might of why they might have said, don't get that salmon because we're in short supply over here because of something else about noise. Greenberger? Yeah, what about tuna? It's such a big fish. Yep. What? There's no way of sustain, sustainably uh, farming those. Is there? <laughs> Well, there is, but it's not, it's, it's not, uh, and you can do it in the ocean. The issue with tuna is that it's mostly being done in Southeast Asia by slavery. That's like the number one, like tilapia. I don't know if that's, there's any slave labor in that. I don't know, but like tuna is the number one slave labor offender because of where and how, and in the quantity that it is uh, harvested. And so it, it is, it's just a difficult one on the human rights factor. And so, and then also there was a lot of, um, and again, this Monterey scorecard is, is really good, but for a long time, people thought that tuna might've had an elevative um, levels of mercury based on where in which they were um, caught. That is shifting a little bit, but there, they still will say to like pregnant mothers, like, don't eat a ton of it or make sure you know exactly where it came from. But it still can be sustainably, I mean, it, it's not disappearing from the ocean. No. Uh, well, bluefin tuna is threatened. And in fact, the Ocean Foundation actually, um, so you're going to crack up now because the Ocean Foundation, you know, we host projects. And you mentioned, well, tunas are really big. We host a pro project that's literally called Tag a Giant. And they, are, they invented the satellite tagging that is used in the world to tag bluefin tunas and because they are endangered. So we have like, I don't know, millions of dollars worth of satellite tags on bluefin tunas swimming around the North Atlantic that we're monitoring. <laughs> but um, they're, they're threatened, but not extinct. Jason, you mentioned um, the human, you know, the human rights and the slaves, and um, and I'm like, you know, I'm I'm researching, trying to ask you about questions, and all of a sudden, I I remember what why people want to um, have farm raised rather than wild caught, and then I researched PETA, <laughs> and their whole website against aquaculture was is like it's laughable, you know, it's pretty. I mean, I don't know, I was laughing at it while you're talking about it. And, but some of it, how do you guys, um, you know, they are anti-aquaculture, you know, again, like you well, said about the genetic engineering and the chemicals and that they're, they're treated badly, that they, half of them die, the salmon are starved and. Yeah, all of that's right. They're right. All of that's right. Cause that's how it's being done now. That, that's right. And so that's why we're saying this needs to be rethought in a way that, um, that doesn't do that. Um, because that is the practice that is being implored right now. And then it's also, um, you know, and I don't, maybe PETA doesn't, again, maybe they're not focused on the ocean, but you have to have a balance. You have to have a mix. It can't be all aquaculture, all wild caught. But if it's all wild caught, we will catch, we will over deplete the ocean and then we won't have any fish for any of us. I mean, that is like the trends that we are absolutely going on. And so what we are saying is that you need sustainable practices that, doesn't, that don't use uh, G, um, GMOs and antibiotics and instead use sustainable filtration systems that ward off all of those external pollutions but, and balance. And so you're alleviating 
if you alleviate the stress on wild caught, that means what you catch wildly is better and more sustainable. And so that's why you need to have a balance of the two. Um, but the, but again, the way that it's currently being done right now is not great. And that's why we're calling for more sustainable practices. And, and did you strut, did I miss, like, how is it being taken, you know, with people having to, you know, having to change their practices on what they're doing? Well, the, the industry is changing because they're losing supply. So ocean acidification, this is like, okay. So the ocean is 30% more acidic today than it was 200 years ago. And it's acidifying faster at the rate than at any point in human history. What happens when the ocean acidifies is it creates really difficult conditions. Like you have to exert more energy to, to produce. And so you, when you have these small uh, like invertebrate, like shrimp or clams or mollusk, they don't have the ability to fully form because the conditions are so harsh because the water is so acidic. So that means the shrimp that these people are getting are smaller. And, and there's fewer of them, which then means the fish that eat those shrimp have less protein. So they're smaller. And the fish that eat those fish are smaller. And so restaurants and private companies are saying, well, wait a minute, our supply is literally diminishing before our eyes. We have to do something about this. And so they're embracing this fully. But what we are saying is if the government doesn't put rules of the road, then you get at what you just saw, where you have companies taking shortcuts and instead of doing something in a sustainable way, they're pumping them with antibiotics and they're giving them genetically modified, you know, and so that's why we're saying you need rules of the road, just like terrestrial farming. So it's done in a sustainable way. But I think balance is the key because right now we're gonna deplete our resources right out of the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question. Getting back to the slavery, use of slaves uh, on the ships, is there anything in marine law or anything in marine law that would prohibit that or control it? And so, what countries are the worst abusers? So it's happening in Southeast Asia. So, you know, yeah. and again, I'm going to send you this name, Tammy, Ghost Fleet. You should really watch this movie. It's, it's amazing. This woman uh literally yeah. has saved over 500 people from slavery and she finds out where they are and she wow. helps rescue them off these boats but uh so it's happening in southeast asia and yeah there are treaties and there are alliances but when you're in international waters there's there's no government that is responsible for that so there are um, some advances in satellite technology that internet, the governments are using internationally to say like, okay, can we track this? And, um, you know, if two ships are meeting in open waters for over 30 minutes, like there's probably a crime that's occurring. So people are using sonar, they're using radar, they're using satellite. But I mean, if you're also doing things, you're probably turning your sonar off. And so it's just very difficult to monitor. Satellites are getting better at trying to identify where this, these abuses are happening. But no, they're, they're, to, to answer your point, it's hard to enforce outside of those 200 nautical miles. You are in international waters and you're just governed by international treaties and alliances. Are you Which can't be a ghost fleet. Ghost fleet. Yeah, that's the that's the name of the movie. Well, they can be enforced by by entities like the UN in certain circumstances, and and when the they can also identify these abuses of if they can catch people doing it when they enter a sovereign nation's jurisdiction, that country's coast guard can do something, but. Otherwise, no, it's very, very difficult once you're out in international waters. That is a huge challenge. 
Sad. Can you hear me? Yes. Can, okay. Is is it a fact that skipjack tuna is the safest tuna to be using? I don't know. I'm going to refer you to the Monterey Bay sheet that you'll get. I don't okay. know about that specific one. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. I have a question. Yeah. Very quickly. There are different types of farming from what I understand. Is that correct? The open ocean farming where they filter out pollutants and keep the fish in a ring in order to grow yes. them, feed them, et cetera, versus the one that we have on land. Yes. How do we know, I mean, farmed is farmed or does it say ocean farmed? That's a great question, thank you. And that's why when I, this, that was my standards thing. We need labeling. Fish is like not labeled. It's really not labeled. And that's where the fraud thing is, is they tell you, you know, it, it is trout, but it's not or something like that. And that's why we're saying if you mandate with these industry, these are called industry certifications that they label where it what mm -hmm. came from. We are, that's what we are calling on is those certification mm -hmm. standards. And, and traceability right now is a huge issue. And um, like I said, Whole Foods has some fish where they specifically put where they got it, but other than them and your local market, no other grocery store is doing that. So we believe that is critical. You mean so you know. Private, a private fishery. Yeah. yeah right. Okay. Yeah. You know, where the fishmonger sells to you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, no, they're not labeled right now. We're calling on them to be. Exactly. Okay. okay. It's just confusing. It is. Absolutely. Yeah. Three different types of Atlantic of salmon in Costco. Three different types. This, this Monterey Bay guide will help because that's why they came out with it. So because they realized a lot of it is marketing. Yeah. And it's very, very difficult. I mean, but also if you think about it, like buying beef is too hard where they tell you, you know, this doesn't have antibiotics, but this is organic. And this was, you know, grass fed, but this is local. And you're like, can I get all of them? What is the, like, how do I? And so that is, I think what is happening is the meat industry, the poultry industry, the pork industry, the fish industry, realize we can make a lot of money doing things unsustainably mm -hmm. but consumers became more educated got more data demanded healthier mm -hmm. options and so now each industry is grappling with their own what does our consumer want and how do we label it and so we're at a kind of important point with aquaculture to get it right because all of those criticisms that people have said, we're saying, yes, they exist. And so if you're going to scale an industry, do it right from the start. Instead of what we've seen with the farming industry where factory farms really got it wrong. And now they're trying to go back and correct a lot of those mistakes. And it's, it's really hard to put that genie back in the bottle. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mrs. Greenberger, do you have a question? No, I'm not. good. Anybody else raise their hand? Yeah. Okay. Hi, Tammy, you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, this is not about sustainability or anything, but I remember one time in Alaska, I saw them vacuum packing the fish. Mm -hmm. Does that actually keep it fr fresher or by a bit? Yeah. Of, yeah. Other than, is that as fresh as frozen or is better? I don't know. A vacuum sealing is great and anything you vacuum seal will keep it much fresher. So that's, yes. And, but also one of the things that we've noticed people doing is styrofoam, polystyrene, styrofoam yeah. is toxic. There are known carcinogens. There are actual known carcinogens in styrofoam. It is not a good material. And a lot of fish and even some like poultry, they put on styrofoam and then they put a plastic wrap over it. And that's what you get in the store. That's not great. 
So what a lot of places have done is they've replaced that with like a biodegradable or, or bio-based or even like sometimes now you'll see salmon on like a wood plank or something, right? So um, that is good. But no, vacuum sealing is great and, and we'll keep it much more fresh because there's no oxygen in there. Um, What's the longevity of something that's vacuum sealed like that? I am not sure because I think it would depend on exactly what how the fresh vacuum sealed. Yeah, when it was done and how. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, everybody, I think. Um, I think you, you, got, you answered everything, Jason. Great. I think everybody thank uh, enjoy this topic, I hope. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thank you all. Yes, thank you all. The, I really appreciate it. Your time. The, Jason, this thanks. is really informative. Yes, and I'll be sending some follow-up resources. And of course, any questions you have, uh, you can use me and the Ocean Foundation as a resource. Good. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, thank well, you so much. Thanks, Jason. I Bye. noted everybody that was on this call, and I will I will um, get in touch, and I'll send you that information. If you uh, contact me first, um, I will gladly email you. But I took a little snapshot of who's on here, so I will send the information to you. Thank you. Thank you. And the Monterey list. Okay. Yes, I will send that to you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I was looking online for it. Can you Google for it? Uh, you probably can. Uh, it's Monterey Bay Aquarium. And then they have a sustainable seafood uh, checklist. So I got to look up exactly where it is. But I, I have it. I've used it before. Okay. And the movie, is that on? Ghost yet? Fleet. Uh, I'm not Ghost. sure where it is because I went and saw the screening, but it's called Ghost Fleet. Like yeah, Ghost I, just, I just looked it up. It's on Hulu, Apple TV, and you can rent it on Amazon Prime for $4.99. So. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> so, yes. Thank I you. Just sent in the comment section, I sent you a link to a review of Ghost Fleet, just if you guys- And, and I heard that the woman who is highlighted in the film, I heard her speak in person. She is incredible. And she literally has personally saved over 500 people wow. from slavery because <laughs> she figures out like, it's all word of mouth and they'll be like, oh, uh, my, you know, because what happens is they get taken, they don't really exactly know, they get offered a job and then they're not allowed to leave. Huh. And so they'll be like word of mouth and she'll figure out that they're there and she uses the legal system. It's incredible. This woman should get a Nobel Peace Prize. So, you know, if you even remotely enjoy listening to me speak, you will love hearing her. So well, we're going to try to get her on here to talk to our members, right? <laughs> All right. Thank you guys. Have a great night. All right, Jason. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Tammy. Yes, ma'am. You're gonna get. Yes. Uh, I'm 